Well, thank you everyone for coming out and thank you so much for the CLRA for giving me this opportunity to talk about composting and organics. This is something that's very near and dear to my heart, something I'm very passionate about. I want to start the talk with this one thought. Man, despite his artistic pretensions and many accomplishments, owes his existence to a six inch layer of topsoil and the fact that it rains. It's a humbling thought. We do many, many exciting things, but at the end of the day, for us to eat, for us to breathe, for us to have clean water, comes from soil. So the overview that I'll have of the presentation here, I'll talk a little bit about what are organics, I'll talk a little bit about waste generation in Alberta, how do we currently manage organics in Alberta, some of the rules and regulations for compost use, and what's the opportunity for what we could be doing? All right, organics. Organics are all around us. We're all part of managing organics. They're the putrescible fraction of municipal solid fit. <laughs> Ways. I love that word, putrescible. What does that mean? It means they can rot easily. So that means this is the stuff that can get smelly and stinky if it sits around for too long. So we're going to have a bunch of organics from, from our meal here today, for example. You might have it in your kitchen. You might have it from your garden. If you mow your lawn and you decide that you don't want a grass cycle and you're hauling out extra leaves or extra trimmings. But there's more organics than that, than the clean and eat stuff. There's the stuff that's maybe not that nice to think about or to work with potentially. You can get the pro processing plant residuals from agriculture, from the ICI sector. Avatar waste, when you have a cow and you want to have a steak, there's a process to get from that from one process to the other, and there is material that needs to be managed in a certain way. Manures and biosolids, those are all organics, and we all keep creating them. So what's the problem? There's organics. Well, we need to think about this in the context of how much we throw away. And when you talk about what we do in Alberta, we have the dubious distinction of being first. We are first with throwing away more than any other provinces in Canada. This is based on StatsCan data from 2010, slightly outdated, but this is something that we've seen for a while. If you take a look here, this is the average. And you can see where we are compared to the average. And here we have disposal amounts in the blue bar. This is average disposal and we're below. So we throw away more and we dispose less than average. And not only are we number one, we've been doing this for a long time. If you take a look at the trend, when we went through the big boom, there was a lot of waste that was generated. Our prosperity tends to be linked to how much waste we generate, but our diversion is not. Now that's a problem. Because these organics, they end up in landfill. If they end up in landfill, they're the ones that give off greenhouse ga gases. They're the ones that contribute to the leachate because there's water in them. And this is the material that, well, is, is this the legacy that we want? Let's take this and put it in a landfill. How long does it take to manage this material then? What's the long-term legacy that we're going to leave if that's how we manage our material in the future? So this is the process we have now. We grow our food. We eat our food, residuals we throw away, and with our garbage, we put it in a bag or a bucket or something and it magically disappears and it goes to the landfill. Now I know we're in Edmonton and that's not a fair thing to say. We do have a large composting operation in Edmonton, but still you saw from the graphs that we're not capturing all the organics possible. So this linear structure is valid for a lot of Alberta. So if we're gonna change it, I suggest we change it into a cycle. So if we're going to change it into a cycle, how are we going to do that? First you bend the line and you get rid of the landfill. So we're still growing food, we're still eating food, and for people that are not managing compost on site at their home, it's going to be taken away and managed somewhere else. How do we fill in this space here? What's missing? Any ideas? Uses of it? Yep. We have to use the material and anything else. We have to process it. There's two pieces here. 
We have to figure out how to process the material to turn it into something usable. And then we need to take that material and bring it back to the land. Unless we complete the circle, we have not recycled organics. We might have processed them, they might be sitting in a big pile somewhere, but they haven't been truly recycled. And then we're in situations where you might have a big pile of stuff and it may or may not end up back on the land. It may end up eventually back in the landfill. So let's talk a little bit more about processing organics. There are a lot of options for how we process organics. So if you have organics, you have a pile of organics, garden scraps, food residuals, whatever it might be, you can deal with stuff on home or at a restaurant. And you can do it in the backyard. Or you can have a large container, do in-vessel composting. You can have worms and do vermicomposting. I have some of those under my desk, and we use that for um, we use that for food waste in the office. Or you can do bokashi, which is a method of fermenting waste that needs to be managed carefully, and it uses different bacteria and lactic acid uh, producing bacteria and the like that grow on bran. Not very common. Cool method though, if that's something you want to explore, it's there. We can also haul it away. And if you haul it away, you can do aerobic composting or vermicomposting. And if you do any of those for a centralized facility, for those common ones, then you end up with a product. You have a soil amendment, you have nutrients, you have things that you can take and you can put back on the land and put it back on the soil. Now, if you want to do waste to energy, take these residuals and turn them into some kind of energy, you have a bunch of different options. And this is where you end up with anaerobic digestion, gasification. The gasification is something that's going to be happening at the city of Edmonton with their new facility there with Entercam. Thermal treatment, uh, that's heat, incineration. Bioreactor landfill, that's where you do a landfill, you cover it up, you get everything to degrade in the landfill cell, and then you can take it out, or you get, you get your gas from it, I mean. And landfill gas collection. Remember, it's the organics that we throw away that turns into the methane. The plastic doesn't degrade easily. Paper doesn't degrade easily. And things in the landfill degrade slowly. Don't get me wrong, you can dig up a landfill that's been entombed and 30 years later you can still read the newspaper, but it still gives off greenhouse gases. So these are all the options. And so from a policy point of view, that creates a lot of questions. If I say, geez, it would be great to be doing something for organics, how do I pick? How does a person pick if this is the program that they want? But we need to think about what is it that we really want. Do we want to have energy? Do we want to have a product? Do we want to have both? Is the technology available and feasible? How much does it cost to run this technology? Anaerobic digestion is certainly more expensive than a windrow composting operation. What are the risks for managing the material this way and what are the benefits? So from a policy point of view, if this is a program that you're thinking of doing or if this is something that you think that you'd like to have in your organization, here are some of the things to think about and some of the tools. If we look at this only from an economic point of view, we'll end up with certain decisions. But that's not always the best answer. We also need to take a look at the social and economic factors, or the costs that we might have. But how do you measure it? What is the cost of climate change? What's the cost of eutrophication of a lake? It's hard to put a number on some of these, but attempts have been made. And so we've done a few different things to try to figure it out for ourselves in our department. How can we make decisions? So one of them, for example, is a cost-benefit analysis. I'm not going to read that definition. I will say that we basically compared the cost of putting compost in a landfill versus um, or taking leaf and yard waste and putting it in a landfill or composting it. And for the most part, it was cheaper composting as long as they had a large enough material. Now, granted, we didn't have transportation costs in there, and transportation of this material is expensive, depending on how you manage a program. But if you're curious, the link is there, and I assume this pre presentation will be available later, and then you should be able to go on the link and you can see the actual report and get some more information if you like. Full cost accounting takes a look at the costs and benefits Plus, it looks at it broader and takes a look at some more, puts some more factors in as well. So you can also use full cost accounting for your decisions. A life cycle analysis takes a look at the start to the finish. 
of a product. And if you take a look at the cost of a product from the start to the finish, you get a very, very different idea of it than if you're just processing it at the end of life. So we did some work on that and it was, review, it was a literature review on life cycle analysis for managing organics. And the consultant that did the work for us, he could only end up looking at a few different options. He was looking at composting, um, anaerobic digestion, landfill with gas capture, and waste to energy. And out of those four options, out of the literature review, he said that it was best to do anaerobic compost, anaerobic digestion or composting, and pick those over waste to energy or landfill gas capture. If you disagree with the results, that's fine. You can take a look. That's his work and that's his recommendation. So, land application. There's tons of ways that we could recycle organics, and there's tons of recycled organic products that we can have. So there's compost, there's erosion control products, there's the digestate from anaerobic digestion, vermicompost. This is compost that was made out of biosolids and leaking yard waste from southern Alberta. These are all different forms of compost. Every single one of these. This is vermicompost. This was from my desk from under my desk. <laughs> I don't work in quite that messy environment. And these worms don't like light, so I did have to take this poor little critter and put him on top so he could uh, so you could see that it was from vermicompost. There's a biosolids one. This here is a compost sock. Compost is filled in a long tube and it's used almost as a speed bump for water going downhill so it can slow down the water and slow down erosion. And this is erosion control compost, which tends to have high amount of woody wood chips in it, and there's fine material that you don't see because it settles to the bottom. And it's also used in hillsides and the like, and I'll, I'll show you some examples of that. But I want to drive home this point. Compost comes from composting. Compost is a product. There's a lot of people that like the word compost, it's a nice green word and it has a nice green feel to it, but the truth is it has to come from a managed product. You can't just throw stuff in the pile and let it sit for a while and pull it out and say, oh look, I got some compost. At least not from a regulatory point of view. It's supposed to be a managed process. It's managed. You do things with it. You have to measure things. You have to measure the temperature. You have to make sure that you're turning it at the right times, that there's enough oxygen there. And you have to make sure that it gets hot enough at one point if you're actually measuring, if you're actually making compost. That's one of the keys, is that there's a thermophilic phase. It has to get hot at some point, and it has to get hot enough. The reason why that's important is because when you start off with weed seeds and you start off with biosolids and different things, there might be, or manures or whatever, you, you might end up with potentially fecal coliform or things in there at the start of the process that you don't want at the end of the process. Composting is the process that helps pasteurize this material so you don't have to worry about these concerns if it's done properly. So what's the opportunity? I believe that we need to link soil and compost use. We want healthy, vibrant, vibrant landscapes around us. And for that, we need healthy soil. Healthy soil has enough organic matter, nutrients, and water for plants to flourish. So if you have soil that's healthy, or if you have soil that's unhealthy, let's start with that, then what you could do is you could add compost to the land. Adding the compost adds the organic matter, the microbes. It improves the physical structure of the soil so it doesn't erode as easily. It increases the water holding capacity. So if you take, right, you, you think of sand, you pour a liter of water in a bucket of sand, if there's some holes in the bottom, it can go out quite quickly. Compost can hold much more than its weight in water. It hangs, it's like a sponge. This is why it has erosion control properties as well, because water doesn't run down as quickly. It modifies and stabilizes pH. It has slow-release macro and micronutrients. It's not an alternative to mineral fertilizers. It's a different beast. It absolutely is a different beast. And it increases beneficial soil biota as long as it's been pasteurized properly. There are some compost that can even suppress plants' diseases. 
There's a lot of work that's being done with that, and the lab scale works well. Sometimes when you bring it out in the environment, it's more of a hit and miss with how well it works, but it still is an opportunity. And it binds contaminants to soil. So if compost can do these things, and there's all these positive attributes to using this as a product, why aren't we doing more of it? So how could we turn this into an actual program? We say that we know what compost is now, we know that we don't want all our organics in the landfill, so what would be a program to actually make it happen? The one program that I've discovered that I keep going back to because they've done such great work is called Soils for Salmon, and it comes out of Washington and Oregon. And what they have done is they've linked exactly what I was talking about, the soil, the stuff that we throw away, and, and soil, and, and how can we put that together? The problem that they were finding in urban areas is that the water that was running off was causing pollution. It was at the point where their salmon populations were decreasing. So they took a look at what they were doing with the land. And in a natural environment, before there was development, they had forests, they had thick topsoil, organic matter layered on top. And when water went down, it went down slowly. A lot of it went up through the trees as evapotranspiration. And there was very little surface runoff, and it tended to be more or less clean because it had been filtered through the soil through the plants. Now you take a look at our urban environments, and it changes. What we're doing now is we have a lot of concrete. We tend to scrape away the topsoil, we scrape away the plants, we put on what we like to live in. But when you have concrete, you're not going to retain any water on there, so it's going to run off. From the roots, you'll get a little bit of trans evapotranspir transpiration coming up from there. But the biggest challenge, I believe, is the amount of soil that we put on our lawns. I used to live in a new housing development. I tried planting a tree. So when I planted the tree, you know, you follow the directions. It says dig this much and this much further so the roots can go in there. You can fill it up with soil so the tree's happy. And I got about, I don't know, this far, and I hit whatever that solid layer is underneath the soil that they give you, where you have to hammer it out, or the clay. So I had to dig out this huge ball of clay just to get my tree planted properly. And it was funny because there's so many people in this new neighborhood and there are people with wheelbarrows and they're just chucking the wheelbarrows along of clay and putting them back in some of the undeveloped areas that were further on down the road. I'm not saying that's what we should do. I'm just saying it's an observation that if we can't plant a tree in our backyard, maybe we need to think about our soil practices here. So we have thin soil and we want it green and we want it really nice and lush, right? That's what we desire in these neighborhoods and that's fine. But because it's on a thin layer of topsoil, it doesn't grow that well. So what do we do? We need to get rid of the weeds, we need to fertilize it, we're putting in all these inputs that end up flowing into our water quality. That's what was happening in this area where they're talking about soils for salmon program. And they decided that they needed to make some changes. Maybe this wasn't the best model if they wanted to keep their salmon healthy. So they took a look at everything that they had, potentially, for organic materials. All the different options that we talked about earlier. I talked about all the different beneficial uses that we have for those organic materials if they turned into compost. There's tremendous opportunity there. But not only did they do that, they also helped with some tools. They started off with a desired outcome. It's not about waste reduction. I started off saying that the problem is the amount of waste that we throw away. But that's not the problem that, or the outcome that we need to focus on. It's not waste reduction. It's on building soil. It's on having healthy soil so we have clean water. We have healthier waterways. We have successful landscapes and healthier communities that we all live in. Now with that type of thinking, we're going to end up with a different way of how we manage our land, especially in urban areas. Now, the Soil for Salmon, one of the things that they do is they provide a lot of education materials and user-friendly tools for their policies. So not only do they have an idea, they also have actual tools. So if you're a landscaper and you're saying, okay, use a compost sounds like a good idea. I'm not sure exactly how to do it. What do I do? You can go to this website and they have the tools, they have the charts of how much material you might need to add so you can get the right mix. They also have minimum requirements for the depth of the soil, minimum amount of organic matter that you have in soil, 
And with this, they've made it user-friendly enough that people like you and me, if we just want it for our lawns, we could figure it out. Landscapers could figure it out. You don't need to be a soil scientist to understand how to use compost. They also have linked the policies that if you want to build in a new area, you have to have enough soil. You have to meet these organic matter requirements and the soil quality requirements. So they have markets for compost. So it's really, really neat to see that they have embraced it that much and have an actual program with all the support that you need so everyone along the stewardship chain can help use this material. So let's take a look at what's happening in Alberta in comparison. There's some really, really great examples of what can be done. Here's one of a green roof from Williams Engineering. And this is from the city of Edmonton, I believe. Their compost is being sprayed on. June 23rd, sprayed on. By September 21st, there's a wildflower garden on top of that roof. Waste was diverted. So if the goal was to decrease waste, we did that. But I would argue that we did a lot more than that by creating a green space in this urban area. Another example is the area by Pinnell Bridge here in Edmonton. If you take a look there, remember that wood chip material that I talked about earlier? That's the erosion control compost and was sprayed on the side. The extra green stuff on the top is actually weeds and they had to be pulled later. But you can see here how this was greening up. This was May 25th and by August 5th it's lush and green. So if we were to manage our landscapes with the right soil for that landscape, and we did this in urban areas, what would our landscapes look like? I think there's tremendous opportunity. And these examples, like I said, there, there are some that are popping up here in the Edmonton area, in Alberta. But they're just, they're more piece by piece than anything as organized as what is currently in Oregon and Washington. A stormwater management, the stuff that comes off the of roads. Maybe this is an unfair picture. This is, this is one of the ways that we can deal with water, with runoff and erosion. It's a silt fence. And the ground's pretty bare there. So compost was put down in those long socks that I was mentioning earlier. They were put in. And within a couple of months, same thing. It greens up. We know when we drive our cars that there's little bits of chemicals that come off the cars from the tires, a little bit from the exhaust and the like, and that ends up in the water. Now, if you have lush green vegetation, thick soil, and large microbial activity in this area here, it'll take a lot more for the water and those materials, those uh, pollutants, to end up in the waterways. So you're ending up with a way of having the soil help filter water. Recently, the government of Alberta surveyed urban and rural municipalities and compost use. Because we were thinking, okay, this seems to be really common in the urban areas that we have, you've got to pick up waste, right? That's an expectation. You live in an urban area, they're going to pick up your waste and it's going to magically disappear and we're all happy. At the same time, they have to manage green spaces. We have our expectations about the sports fields, the parks, the way they look like. What is it that we want to do? So if they have an expectation or an opportunity to reduce compost and use compost, are municipalities linking that together? And are they doing it in a formal way? And there's a lot more information that I'm going to show here because of the time limitations. So I'll just go through a couple of graphs quickly. So for managing green spaces, we spend money on them. We'll mow them, we'll put fertilizers down, we'll irrigate them, we'll aerate them, we'll put herbicides on them, we'll seed them again. But for top dressing with compost, where you might be able to build up that organic matter, add some micronutrients and the like, it doesn't happen as often. Now remember, this is an opportunity. This is something that we are throwing away to go in a landfill, and now we're going out now and buying more products when perhaps there's an opportunity here to change our management style and use what we're throwing away instead. The same thing when you're building green spaces. How are we starting off with the soil so it stays healthy right from the get-go? Mixing compost and topsoil isn't very common. We do use peat moss as well. Again, not that common. But it's just a, it's a question that I have is if we want to have healthy green spaces in urban areas or anywhere where you might be managing land, what is it that we need for organic matter for that land to be healthy? For the erosion control products, what is it that we use? For the most part, silt fences. If you're a proponent of using locally made goods, 
I don't know of any local coconut mats that are around. Now I have to say that compost, you can use a compost blanket, but compost blankets can't be used everywhere that er other erosion control tools can be used because there has to be a setback from waterways. That's the way it's been written up in our policies. But there, perhaps there's an opportunity there as well. So there's the report if you're interested in more about tools from municipal compost use and just more about tools for erosion control or other things that you might be using it for. Okay, buying and selling compost. If you're interested in buying compost for use, there's a few rules that you need to know about. You need to follow the CFIA. The person that's selling it needs to follow the CFIA, Canadian Food Inspection Agency, and follow their labeling requirements. The label requirements will say how much can be applied to land based on heavy metal accumulations. The CFIA manages the environmental safety of the material. We also have guidelines for compost quality and unless it's written in regulations, you don't have to follow it. But here in Alberta we say that compost needs to follow CCME, compost quality guidelines. And there we have limits on foreign matter, so if there's plastic in there or glass in there that has to be limited, it has to meet certain re um, restrictions for how much is allowed in there. The maturity stability of the compost, it can't be really green or fresh because then it's phytotoxic. And the pathogens have to be limited, obviously, and there's heavy metal limits in there. Now, those, both the CCME and the CFIA, deal with the environmental safety of the material. If you're talking about an agronomic standard, there's something a little bit different that the industry is putting together. And it's already being used by several compost producers in Alberta, so it's not super common across Canada yet. And it's called the Compost Quality Alliance. There you can send your compost off for testing and you get a completely different lab result than if you're just doing CCME testing. The idea is that you have different kinds of compost, just like I showed you in that picture, and not every compost is going to be suited for every use. If you have a contaminated site that has salts in it, you might want to have something very specialized in that compost to make it work well for reclamation. If you're talking about having something for um, horticulture, for planting seedlings, you're going to have different requirements. So this is a way of trying to tease out those differences and figuring out, is your compost the right product? At this time, there's only one lab in all of Canada that does the testing for the Compost Quality Alliance. So if labs are interested, there is an opportunity to find out more information and see if this is something that they want to get into as well to also be able to certify to the CQA level. So let's talk about the vision again. How can we beneficially recycle organics back to land? Let's think about building soil, protecting water quality, creating successful landscapes, and healthier communities for all of us to live in. If we want to build an organic cycle for Alberta, where we're really recycling all our organic residuals, we need to start first with the soil. Then we need to create policies that bring compost back to the land. It doesn't do anyone any good if it's just in a pile at a composting facility. And there's other recycled organic products that we can use as well, as such as compost. It's just that compost is one of the most common ones used in Alberta. What are the initiatives that we have for processing organics? How can we support those? And all of this needs to be supported by a whole perception shift that organics are valuable. Banana peel doesn't belong in the garbage. It's valuable. Apple core, that's fertilizer that you paid for already. Why are we throwing it away? We have better options. And that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for your kind attention.